metformin uh, would be a good choice in these kind of people, uh, especially if the body mass index is more than uh, 23.5. For Indians and Chinese, keep in mind the cutoff for being labeled as overweight is 23.5. So about 23.5, 24 BMI, you can even consider metformin for in this kind of scenario. That's also one of the recommendations. Next scenario, it's a 70 year old female, with the fasting blood sugar and PPBS of 140 and 300. HbA1c is 7.8, just above the basic minimum cutoff of 7.5. She's already on metformin, glimipride, cetagliptin and voglibose. She's not willing for insulin. What would be an oral antidiabetic drug of choice? Ideally, as per guidelines, she should be on may perhaps a regular insulin before meals or a, a small dose of pre-mixed insulin. Any suggestions? Yes, <laughs> excellent. That's a liberal HPMC target is allowed in the elderly. Yeah, that's true. In the elderly, you can keep the HPNC target at around eight. Yes, PPBS is high. You still have to think of a drug here. Yeah. The HPNC target is kept high to avoid the risk of hypoglycemia in the elderly. Hypoglycemia can cause falls and uh, further complications. So to give something, like you, there is a choice and that, that choice can be considered. Uh, maybe that choice of uh, medicine would be um, dapaglyphosin. DAPA, CANA, EMPA, any of those SGLT2 inhibitors. They cause renal glycosuria. They usually start working when the sugar levels in the blood are above the renal threshold of 180 to 200. So even if the, the blood sugar spikes in the blood to about 250, uh, 200 or so, it won't they stay there for long because when the gly renal glycosuria happens, gradually the blood sugar levels will come down to around 200, 250 levels. At least that much control can happen. The best thing about this drug is that it won't cause hypoglycemia because it starts working really only after 180 to, two, one, uh, 180 to 200 levels. So that can be considered. Uh, another choice which can be considered could be for pioglitazone. But again, you have to be very careful about this because pioglitazone in the long term can cause in females, elderly, osteoporosis. Okay, the, People are worried about the risk of uh, bladder cancer because of pioglitazone. But that was a very needless controversy many years back, in my humble opinion. Most of us who practice diabetology have never seen pioglitazone causing bladder cancer directly. Uh, actually, we are more likely to see a fluid retention because of pioglitazone. There might be pedal edema, there might be facial puffiness, breathing difficulty, even heart failure because of pioglitazone. But bladder cancer is not really uh, one of the top uh, concerns we have about that. In the longer term, there might be osteoporosis. So pioglitazone should perhaps be avoided in this patient. Although it can be considered in the short term, fine. But again, the drug coming back would be dapaglyphosin if the lady is willing to, uh, not willing to take insulin at all. So DAPA can be considered. Again, uh, it comes with some um, catch points uh, in patients with UTI or high risk of UTI or diabetic foot infections. You have to be careful about um, starting or continuing dapaglyphosin because both of these incidents can rise if the patient is on any of the glyphosins. Scenario number eight, 55 year old male fasting of 170 PPBS of 200, HVNC seven. He is on metformin two grams per day, cetagliptin 50 mg per day. He wants to aim for HbA1c of 6.0 and does not want hypoglycemias. What are the drug options? Pyoglitazone, yes, that's a good choice. The reasons we have already, I think we have discussed in the previous uh, case scenarios. It won't cause hypoglycemia. It can cause minor weight gain. Fine. Patient is not worried about that. Then you can give that. Dapaglyphosin, perhaps in this particular scenario, might not be that useful. Uh, Voglibose, uh, you can add. No harm in adding Voglibose. It's a relatively safe drug. 
but it might not control the fasting blood sugar as much. And if you notice in this case, the uh, fasting blood sugar versus postprandial blood sugar, the difference is not much, which means again, post meals, the insulin surge is happening. So again, in this case, you have to aim at reducing the fasting blood sugar, which will again reduce the postprandial blood sugar. So yes, pyoglitazone would be a good choice. Voglibose may be, may not be kind of. We can even uh, consider increasing the dose of cetagliptin. It's only on 50 mg per day. It can be increased to 100 mg per day. So these two or three options you can consider without uh, much risk of hypoglycemia. Fine. So those are good answers. Good. Scenario number nine. There are three more scenarios to go. I think, uh, I hope I'm not taking too much of time. 70-year-old uh, female, fasting blood sugar of 200, PPBS of 310. As someone mentioned very rightly, in the elderly, the HPIC target should be liberal. And on purpose, I kept the fasting and PPBS on the higher side so that we would have something to think about. And these are actually scenarios which come up in day-to-day -day practice. This 70-year-old lady has a fasting of 200 and PPBS of 310, HPIC of 8.3. She's on metformin 2 grams per day, glimipride of 4 mg per day and pyoglitazone 30 mg per day. She has got leg swelling and mild dyspnea on exertion. Which OAD has to be adjusted? Yeah, Dr. Ashima, you're right. Pyoglitazone has to be stopped for two reasons. First of all, straightforward, it has caused leg swelling. The fluid retention is causing probably fluid buildup in her lungs, pulmonary edema, and that might push her into congestive cardiac failure also. So that has to be stopped. Secondly, in the long term for females, pyogritazone should be given with caution. It can cause osteoporosis as we uh, discussed previously. Excellent uh, suggestion again, glyptin can be added. Yeah, uh, cetagliptin should be a good choice for this lady instead of pyogritazone. Again, uh, we have to keep in mind that unfortunately, pyogritazone is the only drug in its class with that kind of action. It's a beautiful drug. If used properly, it can give very good results to the right kind of patients apart from just glycemic control. So when you take out a drug which reduces insulin resistance, like pyoglitazone, the other drug might not um, compensate for it in the same way. So and again, you have to keep in mind, in some of these patients, glyptins might not work. In about 5% of people, glyptins are, may not work also. So once you substitute one drug for the other, you have to watch for a rise in sugars, whether the, uh, and, and, and whether, um, uh, the patient is uh, not getting hypoglycemia also. The hypoglycemia not get, not be because of the fault of the gliptin which you're adding, but it may be because of some other mechanism or because of the postprandial control which gliptin will add to glimipride. There might be uh, hypoglycemia four to five hours after meals because pyoglitazone does not cause hypoglycemia. Gliptin won't cause severe hypoglycemia, but the patient might be pushed into hypoglycemia because of the additive effect of a gliptin and the glimipride. So this is this part. This point has to be kept in mind when you substitute this drug for the other. Another option could be voglibose. Very less likely to work, like pyoglitazone 30 mg per day. But even like you can maybe think of voglibose if the PPBS is high. All right. Scenario number ten uh, is a 65 year old male, FBS 220. Uh, you have said that FPS is also high. Yeah, FPS is high. Uh, Cetagliptin can help to an extent in the fasting blood sugars also, although the effect is more pronounced in the postprandial area. You are right, actually. Another option to this would be to add a basal insulin. If FPS remains high for this patient, on review, you can always start a, a long-acting insulin, a basal insulin. If the fasting sugar continues to remain high, and if you want to ch choose only one-time insulin, the options would be giving uh, NPH insulin one set night in a small dose, or maybe insulin glargin one set night in a small dose. All the options are, uh, all the insulins are also a good option, but that, that perhaps can come during uh, the time when the patient comes for a review. Uh, no, adding voglibose in this scenario would not help. I mentioned that. You are very right, actually, because fasting sugars are high. Um, uh, voglibose alone would not help. It would only be, at best, an adjunct drug. NPH 4 or 6. If you stop pyogitism 30 mg, I think uh, an NPH of 6 or 8 would be good. 
four would be a very very small dose actually uh, for a normal weight person like say let's assume the patient is about 50 to 60 uh, 60 to 70 kg uh, nph of six or eight units given at night should be okay since it's a very uh, slow peaking insulin it takes about two to three hours to peak and then remains there for six to eight hours if the patient is not at risk of hypoglycemia like that especially when you're stopping 30 mg of pyoclitazone it should be okay to start at six to eight units at night. Six units should be fine if you're worried about hypoglycemia. Four would be too low in my opinion. Yeah. So the, the next scenario. So metformin, glimipride, and NPH8 will be fine in this case. I think, I guess so, yes. Again, if you're really worried about hypoglycemia, NPH of six at night should be fine. Uh, if you see the postprandial sugars, if the patient still comes with a... a if the patient comes back on review with a high fasting blood sugar, you can adjust the NPH or the Lantus uh, or even an ultra long acting insulin uh, if the patient is affording like insulin deglodeg or insulin rhizodeg. Once the fasting is controlled, if still the PP base is controlled, then perhaps you have to think of uh, adding a pre-mixed insulin, 30, 70 or 50, 50, two or three times a day. Yeah, that is also an option.